Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Hi. So thankful uh, everyone is here to join us. Um, welcome. Um, if you would, in the chat, as you join, let us know where you're joining from. Um, we're so happy to have everyone here with us tonight um, for a really important conversation around fertility. And um, specifically, we'll be talking about endometriosis, um, LA, LA. Oh, great. Everyone who's in LA, we have Dr. Ben Nixon with us tonight. She's in LA. Um, we also have Dr. Kane. She's in Atlanta, Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn, we're opening up in Brooklyn later this year. So that's exciting. But we are you know, also in Manhattan too, Austin, great, Miami, we're coming to Miami this year. Um, They're asking us where are you from. Welcome, Woody. welcome, welcome. Woody, come. Okay, Woody, bye. Oh, you everyone. Welcome, we're just going to give people just another minute here. Um, to join. Welcome. As you join, just drop in the chat where you're calling in from. We're so happy you're here. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Bendixson and Dr. Kane here in a minute. Um, but there is just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we're going to go through this whole presentation, give you a little bit more information about your fertility, the questions to be asking, um, what, uh, what fertility means what the hormones means, what happens at an assessment, what's Kind Body all about. Um, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat. Um, we'll take a few questions throughout the presentation. We'll probably answer the majority of your questions, or at least we hope we will. Um, and then at the end, uh, both Dr. Keene and Dr. Bendixson will take a few questions from you guys and answer them for you. Cool. Okay. So tonight, um, whoops, the slides look a little funny. We go back and front again. Perfect. So tonight we are so lucky to have Dr. Bendixson with us. Uh, she is based in LA. So anyone who's there, um, you can come see her. And then also we have Dr. Kane. She is based in Atlanta, uh, but will later this year be um, opening up our Charlotte, North Carolina clinic. So we're so excited for that. Um, so welcome. Thank you both um, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Bendixson, I'm going to kick it off to you. You probably just need to unmute yourself. Um, and I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thanks, Amanda Lynn. Um, I'm so excited to have everyone here in this late afternoon on my side of the country and evening where you are, Amanda Lynn, is, and where Dr. Kane is. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, next slide. All right. So, well, you know what? Welcome to Kind Body. We're so happy to meet you. We're so happy to have you here at Kind Body. We are truly on a mission to make reproductive health care and fertility care accessible for all. Um, and we serve so many of our patients directly through their employers because guess what? We are actually a benefit. We are a fertility and family building benefit for many of our patients through their employers. But we service and take care of so many of our patients that don't have our insurance. And so you don't have to have our insurance to see us. You can have your own insurance or not have insurance, which unfortunately fertility care is just not covered enough, but we're excited to take care of you. All right, thank you. So at Kind Body, we, we do everything. We, we are not just a fertility clinic, although we cover the entire uh, fertility service um, spectrum. We do fertility assessments, virtual consults, egg freezing, embryo freezing, IUI, IVF, um, donor egg, genetic testing, and now we have our at-home fertility test, which Dr. Kane will talk about a little bit later um, this evening. Um, but in addition to that, we do gynecology care, um, and we offer a lot of our really just overall health services. So for our gynecology care, um, in addition to having an egg freezing cycle, you can come and have a pap smear with us, all right? We can help you with issues like polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, which we'll be talking about tonight, fibroids, um, and just your normal well woman checkup. Um, in addition, we, we do have a lot of services where we provide support and counseling. We have LGBTQ services, donor and surrogacy. We can help you with wellness. We can help with nutrition and we can help with mental health and mindfulness, which is so important. 
All right, next slide. Thank you. Um, so we are really on a mission, right? And that is because we truly believe that fertility and reproductive care is essential. Um, and one of the most important factors that so many people are not aware of is that reproductive health and fertility can change with time, right? And making sure um, that everyone knows that is a priority for us. So truly, um, making sure that women and men understand what's going on with their bodies, that's such a priority. And we also believe it's imperative to provide these services, to provide reproductive health care, fertility care. We want to do it in a welcoming and inclusive way that is truly such a wonderful experience to all of the, our patients that we take care of. So let's start and go with the basics. All right, fertility 101, right? So let's just go down to kind of the very nuggets of the basics of fertility and getting pregnant, right? We are taught actually our entire lives, like how to not get pregnant, right? All of those lectures in high school where they're talking about contraception. Well, no one kind of talks about what happens after that. What do we do when we're ready to start trying? And for a lot of couples, they just don't know where to begin. And we want to make that right. We want to change that narrative. Next slide. All right. So what is it that we need to know? All right. What are the things that we have to know about kind of planning for a future? And one of the most important things is to think about is age. Next slide. All right. So if we start at the beginning, like the true beginning um, for women, we're born with all the eggs that we're ever going to have, which is about 2 million eggs. And by the time we reach our first period, then we're already down to 300 to 400,000 eggs. So we've lost the vast majority, right, from birth until the age of what, right, 9, 12, whenever you get your first period. Um, and from there, whether you're on birth control or not, whether you're bleeding regularly or not, you're gonna lose up to a thousand eggs every month. So it's a lot. And we kind of think that that's unfair. And most of our patients do too. Next slide. So for a lot of women, they kind of hear about this mystical number of 35. And, and what does that mean? Does fertility just like drop off at 35? I think a lot of doctors will point to 35 at an age where fertility declines. Um, but guess what? It isn't just a switch. It doesn't just turn off one day and it was on the day before, right? Fertility starts declining even as early as the age of 27. And unfortunately, as we get older, our eggs get older too. And there are very few things that we can do to control that. And in fact, we actually know that one in 10 women who are under the age of 35 will experience a premature low ovarian reserve. But quantity of eggs is not the only thing that we are um, should be worried about, right? Quality also changes as we get older. So both of those things, quality and quantity, they're both going to get, they're both going to change, and they're both going to start changing more significantly the older we get. With poor egg quality, this can actually lead to infertility. It can lead to an increased chance of having a miscarriage or passing on a genetic abnormality to our child. So both quantity and quality matter. Next slide. So the reality is you're never too young and you're actually never too old to learn about your fertility. It's important to learn where you stand, how everything works, and what your options are. And it's really important that you have this information so that you can be proactive. So when exactly are women the most fertile? So if you have regular cycles, all right, you're, and that means why regular cycles, I'm talking about like regular cycles and also having your period every 28 days, then your most fertile days are day 10 to 14. If you have longer cycles, let's say 35 days, or you have shorter cycles, let's say 21, then that time period where you're the most fertile is gonna shift a little bit. It's gonna shift a little bit earlier if you have shorter cycles, and it's gonna shift a little bit later if you have longer cycles. 
So it's really important to talk to a provider and understand what are your most fertile days if your window is not exactly in that 10 to 14 because your cycles are not exactly 21 days. Next slide. There are lots of things that affect our ability to conceive and have a baby. We can think about our diet and our lifestyle. You know, what are the things that we're eating? Are we eating, um, let's say fruits and vegetables? Are you eating organic fruits and vegetables? Or if not, are you at least making sure they're washed really well so you can get rid of that pesticide residue? Have you thought about your family history? Is there something that you could inherit from your family? You could pass on to your child, all right? Have you thought about your own medical conditions that could affect your pregnancy? And what about your mental health? All of those things are super important. Our body is truly function as a whole, and they respond to not only our everyday routines, but also our environment. And so it's really important that we think about all of these factors. All right. One of the most interesting things that a lot of my patients will ask me about is birth control pills. Um, and like, for example, a marina IUD. So all of those hormonal contraceptions, people get really worried that being on hormonal contraception will affect their ability to get pregnant um, in the future. So for example, if I'm on birth control pills for 15 years versus five, is it going to make it harder for me to get pregnant? And the answer is no, absolutely not. So while there are lots of things that you need to worry about, that is not one of them. And contraception is really important when you're not trying to get pregnant. Next slide. So what does it mean to be infertile? So infertility is technically defined as the inability to get pregnant or stay pregnant after one year of trying. However, when you're 35 or older, we start thinking about infertility and viewing it in a different way because things are changing so rapidly in your body in terms of both the quantity and quality of eggs like we talked about before. So it's really important to get a workup and start fertility treatments really just after six months of trying. We don't like to prolong that um, in women that are 35 and older. And when you look at the overall data, one in eight couples is going to experience infertility. That's really high, unfortunately. And a third of the time, there's a male factor issue. So it's not just on the female side. There can be sperm issues too. Next slide. So truly at the end of the day, there's no magic formula in terms of like how you should go about having your family, building the family that you want. Everyone is different. The only way that you can make good decisions for yourself is to learn about where you personally stand. So what can we do for you at Kind Body? So at Kind Body, you can come in and have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a fertility specialist. They can talk to you about your medical history. They can talk to you about what's going on in your life. And most importantly, talk with you about your family planning goals. What do you want? How do you imagine your family? When do you want to have your first baby? When you'd like to have your last baby? And how many kids do you have? They're going to be able to put together a personalized plan and decide with you what your next steps should be. And this can be the very first step of your fertility journey. So a couple of the things that we can do when you come into our office that is um, a little bit more than just kind of, we add that on to like what we do when we talk to you are two different tests. The first one is an internal ultrasound. And that ultrasound is gonna allow us to count what are called follicles that are inside the ovaries. Follicles are fluid filled sacs that contain the eggs. And we can see how many eggs your body is recruiting each month because your body recruits a set of eggs each month. And that's really important for assessing how many eggs you have. The other thing that we can do is we can do blood work and we can look for fertility hormones. And one of the most important hormones that we can look for is a hormone called AMH, anti-mullerian hormone. And both of those hormones are really important so that we can help um, discover with you and determine what is your timeline. Next slide. So both the uh, blood work and the ultrasound are really going to give us good information about the quantity of eggs that you have. 
it's not going to tell us about quality because the general rule of thumb is that your quality is going to decline with age and age is going to be the most important factor that determines the quality of your eggs. But the quantity of eggs is really important. That can help you make decisions now. It can make you um, understand if you're going to go through an egg freezing cycle, how many eggs you can expect in one cycle. It can help you determine when you maybe want to think about trying to get pregnant, because what are your options going to be later based on what the quantity is at this point in time? Next slide. So there are so many options available. You can, you can do egg freezing. You can think about embryo freezing. You can think about fertility treatments if you've been trying to get pregnant and having a little bit harder time. You can start with the basics, which is called an IUI, an intrauterine insemination, or you can think about IVF, right? IVF is in vitro fertilization. In some instances, you're going to have to think about what we call our third party options. This is an egg donor using a sperm donor or a gestational carrier. A gestational carrier is someone who's going to carry your pregnancy for you. Maybe you have some medical issues that's going to prevent you from carrying a pregnancy. Well, we don't want that to prevent you from building your family. So you can use a gestational carrier in that scenario. So at this point, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Kane, and Dr. Kane is going to walk you through some of these fertility options, and we're going to start with egg freezing. Oh, can, can you hear me now? I was having trouble getting unmuted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kristen. That was a great, uh, a great overview. And uh, there's a lot of questions in the chat about egg freezing. And uh, we'll try to get to them while I'm speaking. But what is egg freezing? Egg freezing gives us a chance to preserve your fertility where you are now so that down the road, if you want to have another baby or you know, your first baby, uh, you have uh, the option of doing that with eggs that are the number and quality that you have at the age you are now. So what we do is we extract the eggs from the ovaries and freeze them for later use. Next, please. So when is it right to think about egg freezing? We ask you to ask yourself four questions. First of all, how old are you? And um, does it make sense? If you're really very young, you may decide to choose to, you know, reassess your fertility in a few years and freeze your eggs at that time. However, if you're, if you're older, you may want to consider freezing eggs right away, especially if you're thinking you might want to delay childbearing even as little as six months or a year if your egg count is starting to drop a little bit. How many children are in your ideal family? Uh, I ask all my patients this and, and we really do want to know and, and dream big, you know, if, if you think, oh, two or three, you know, but I'd be happy with one. Let's talk about how you would get to three. You can always scale back if you want to. And how old do you want to be when you have your first child? And how old do you want to be when you have your last child? If uh, this one's a little tricky, but if you think that, you know, it's about a year to be pregnant, get pregnant and be pregnant and deliver your baby, and then another year of having your new baby at home while you're recovering from the birth and the pregnancy and, and learning your baby and enjoying the baby and, and breastfeeding, if you're doing that, uh, it can be about a about two years between each child, typically. Uh, and they're closely spaced. So those are the things that we ask you to think about yourself when you think about if egg freezing is right for you. Next, please. Next slide. It looks like it's stuck on the same slide. There we go. So how does this work? You know, if we freeze your eggs, are we going to use your eggs up? I get asked that question a lot. And um, basically, if you remember what Dr. Van Dixon said about, you know, how many eggs you, you have and, and how many, how you lose, you know, a certain number of eggs a month. 
what happens with egg freezing? Well, with egg freezing every month, some of the eggs that your body would normally just be getting rid of gets a chance to play. It's like a team of eggs that gets to play and, and, and gets to maybe try to make a baby. And that's called your cohort. And it's made up of eggs that grow big enough to form a little fluid filled sac around them called follicles. So what we try to do is get all the eggs or as many eggs as possible in that cohort to grow and mature instead of just one like your body normally tries to do. Next, please. So we give you hormones to stimulate the growth of the follicles and the hormone we use is called follicle stimulating hormone. It's actually called that. We also call it FSH nice and obvious. And what that hormone does is it gets all the eggs in the cohort or as many as possible to grow. So we're not using up your eggs. We're just rescuing eggs that your body would normally otherwise not do anything. And we give you this medication, it's given by injection, and we give you this medication with daily shots during the egg freezing process. Next. So these hormones take about 10 days to work. And um, they, uh, during that period of time, we follow you pretty closely. So you'll probably come in for between four and six office visits during an egg freezing cycle to see, um, how the eggs are growing. We do ultrasounds. We can see how many are growing, when they're going to be ripe and ready to go, when you're going to be ready to retrieve them. And then we do blood work so we can adjust the dose of that FSH hormone uh, to get an optimal response. Next. So the timeline looks like this. And if you look at this um, stimulation calendar, um, most people who are freezing eggs are taking some kind of birth control pills to kind of line up all the eggs in a group. So they're all about the same size and, and respond about the same amount to the medications we give. And that helps us get as many eggs as possible to ripen up out of that cohort. So we stop the pills, say on a Sunday would be your last day of pills and you'll get your period a few days later. And then we bring you in on a Friday to start your fertility meds. And, um, you take those medications, come in periodically for your ultrasound visit. And when the eggs look ripe and ready to go, then we do what's called a trigger. And a trigger is a different medication that causes the eggs to loosen up from the wall of the ovaries so we can actually get them out. And the way that that works is um, if the trigger is uh, not given, the eggs remain tightly attached to the ovary and all we get is fluid when we try to aspirate the eggs. If we give the trigger and we wait too long to try to get the eggs, you ovulate and then the egg is gone. So that trigger is given at a specific time, usually 35 hours before we want to schedule the egg retrieval. Next. And then the egg retrieval itself is a short procedure, about 15 minutes. It's done in a small operating room right in our kind body clinic. Um, and you're under anesthesia, uh, which is given to you in an IV. Uh, you just have a little nasal cannula oxygen. It's very low key. And when you wake up, you feel fine. It's just a couple of needle sticks uh, that we've used to get eggs out of each ovary. Next. Sometimes people talk about embryo freezing versus egg freezing. So what are the differences? The first part I just described is the same for both. And the pregnancy rates are the same for both. Egg freezing uh, is great if you don't have sperm right now. For instance, say you aren't in a relationship or aren't sure that this is the person that you want to have a baby with down the road, or um, you're thinking you might wind up using donor sperm at some point, uh, but don't want to decide on that right now. So Egg freezing uh, allows you more options in terms of your sperm source. Um, it's also less expensive because we, as soon as the eggs are out, they get frozen and we don't do any of our lab stuff with them. Embryo freezing, uh, say you have a person uh, whose sperm you're going to use and you want to know what you've got. You know, for instance, if you're worried, you're not going to have enough 
or if you want to do testing of your embryos for chromosome problems or genetic problems, you want to make sure you have enough normal embryos, then embryo freezing can be a great way to go with this. Uh, it is more costly because now we have to do, you know, fertilizing the eggs with the, the sperm and grow them in culture um, and maybe do that genetic testing. Um, so it's a little more complicated, but it's great if you're, you know, you're in a committed relationship, you know who you're going to have this baby with and um, you want to do some additional testing. Next. So what comes after that? You've frozen your eggs or you've frozen your embryos and you're thinking, you know, you're, you're good to go. So we hope uh, you're going to get pregnant on your own. You know, this is, this is just to, as a backup for most people. Um, they can be stored, eggs and embryos can be stored for years and years and years, as long as you want, without hurting or harming the, the eggs. They don't get freezer burn. They just stay fine when they're little in their little tube. And when you're ready for them, we can take them out. But we hope that you'll be able to get pregnant naturally without difficulty. However, if you need those eggs, you can use them. That's what they're for. Next. Now, what is IVF? Well, IVF is the same as embryo freezing, um, except that once we have the embryos, then we have to put them back in the uterus. So once the eggs are fertilized and the embryo is ready to grow, uh, then uh, we can place them in the uterus uh, after, the, after the egg retrieval, or more commonly, we freeze the embryos, and then we let your body kind of get back to normal, um, and then give you hormones to thicken up the lining of the uterus and make an optimal environment for the embryo. And then the embryo is carefully trans transferred into the uterus with, with a very thin, flexible little plastic tube under ultrasound guidance. Next. There are other ways to have a baby as well, other paths to parenthood. So simple things are things like insemination, uh, which is also called IUI, stands for intrauterine insemination, where we place sperm inside the uterus on the day that you're ovulating. Uh, we can do that with medications. Those medications, uh, we call that ovulation induction, where we give you, say, fertility pills or sometimes injections. And we monitor you until your eggs are ripe. And then we actually do want you to ovulate and place the sperm up inside your uterus. Some people just take fertility medications and have sex at the right time. And we help people figure out when that is. And then of course there's IVF. There's the option of donor sperm for IUI or IVF. And there's an option of donor egg uh, as well. If uh, for instance, you are unable to produce eggs or healthy eggs or, or um, you have gotten older and weren't able to freeze eggs when you were younger, those are all options. So there are other family building op options like egg donors, sperm donors, and then there's gestational carriers, which most people think of as surrogates. So um, a gestational carrier is a, a woman who um, has a healthy uterus, has had a history of healthy pregnancies, and um, a fertilized egg is placed into her uterus and she carries the baby for you. Next. So what do you do with all this information you're getting today? Well, um, it doesn't really matter when you're trying to get pregnant. We'll see you when you want to be seen. You know, if you haven't started trying yet, or you've only been trying for a short time, but you just want to make sure everything's okay. So you don't have to worry and stress out about it, or you've been trying for a while and it's not happening. Uh, you can come in and be assessed. You can come in and be seen. At Kind Body, we have a sign up in every single one of our offices that says own your future. And we're all about that. We want you to be able to have the power to decide what your family looks like and when it's going to happen. That, that is true power, being able to make those decisions for your own life. Next. We're going to do a little bit um, also today, a little bonus information on endometriosis there. I saw some questions in the chat when Dr. Van Dixon was talking 
about, endom about endometriosis. And so hopefully this will answer some of those questions at all uh, for you. So what is endometriosis? Well, every month when you get your period, you know, you thicken up the lining of the uterus prior to your period. And then if you're not pregnant, you shed that lining and that's where your period bleeding comes from. But the uterus and tubes are an open system. So a little bit of that blood and tissue does reflux back through the fallopian tubes. And um, sometimes little bits of that tissue can implant on the surface of the uterus or the ovaries or the, uh, the bowel or other parts of the pelvis. And, and those, um, that tissue can, um, shrink and swell as your hormones rise and fall during your cycle and bleed a little bit and cause more scarring and, and, um, and continue to grow. And that can be problematic. Next. So common symptoms of endometriosis are, um, pelvic pain, especially with uh, your menstrual period, abnormal uterine bleeding, either between your cycles or really heavy periods, um, abdominal pain, bloating, infertility. Sometimes people have nausea and vomiting with periods that can be a sign of endometriosis or pain with bowel movements or diarrhea and constipation with periods. All of those things can be symptoms of endometriosis. Next. So how do we diagnose endometriosis? The, the gold standard for diagnosing endometriosis is surgery, unfortunately. However, not everyone who has endometriosis or who we think has endometriosis absolutely needs to get surgery for that. In fact, most people don't. We can usually get a pretty good sense if you have endometriosis or not, well, the pelvic and abdominal exam and ultrasound, MRI can be done in some cases, although it um, can be difficult to see endometriosis with MRI. And um, we might not be able to confirm that it's endometriosis, but there's a lot we can do with a high level of suspicion. Next. So what are treatment options for endometriosis? Well, if the problem is pain, then usually we work on, on that, try to minimize the pain because it can be so bad. If the pain is mild or moderate, we usually start with ibuprofen or over-the-counter pain medications. Uh, a next line of therapy might be birth control pills or some other kind of hormonal birth control like the patch or the NuvaRing or even um, a Mirena IUD. Um, and we can do things like Depo-Provera as well. However, if the pain is getting worse, then there are other medications that we can do as well. One is estrogen suppression. So how do we do that? Well, we can give you medication like Lupron, which is a shot that's given once a month or once every three months to just kind of quiet down the estrogen because estrogen is a hormone that feeds endometriosis. Or there are um, oral medications as well that also work pretty well to lower estrogen levels and they're uh, more quickly reversible because you take them daily. So when you stop taking them, then, um, you know, your cycles go back to normal. If it's another option is the surgery that we talked about before can not only diagnose endometriosis, but treat it by removing those implants that are causing pain, especially if the implant is in a very sensitive area, uh, that's causing you a lot of pain. Laparoscopy can help that. And that's a telescope that goes through the, the navel, the belly button, and uh, we can look inside your belly and, and remove uh, scar tissue with very small instruments that pass tiny, tiny incisions. Worst case scenario, uh, a hysterectomy can be also done to, uh, to treat endometriosis. And this is more old school. It's kind of on here just as for your knowledge, but uh, if you know, since we're all about getting people pregnant, <laughs> that's not necessarily what we talk about too much, but it is an option once your family's complete, especially if the pain is really, really severe. Next. So how does endometriosis affect your fertility? Well, as I said, um, 
every month, if you have endometriosis every month when your those little implants grow and shrink and bleed and then heal over and scar over, inflammation and scarring from the endometriosis can um, actually cause diminished ovarian function and ca cause damage to the ovaries. It can be an inhospitable environment for the eggs to fertilize in the tubes or for the embryo to implant in the uterus. And it can also um, cause scarring of the fallopian tubes and blockage of the tubes that makes it impossible for the sperm and the egg to meet. Uh, there also seems to be an increased rate of egg loss, which causes decreased ovarian reserves. So sometimes people with endometriosis have lower egg numbers and, and um, don't get as many eggs with IVF. Next. We have some other options, and this is the last thing I want to talk about is our new um, testing option called Kind at Home. So Kind at Home is an at-home fertility test. We have two, one for women and one for men. And this is a great option for people who just want to get a general sense of is there a problem? Um, is there something we should know? But they're not quite ready to come in for a whole visit, um, meeting with um, meeting with the doctor, a whole big assessment. They just want to kind of get a sense of what's going on. So this is a great option for busy professionals, busy people, people who don't live near a kind body, but want to get some testing done. And um, we call it kind at home. And you can just get it off of our website. Next. So the way this works is everything you need is right there inside the kit. Uh, our Kind Body website has little videos on how it's done. Um, our partner, Anu Kathirasan, did a beautiful little quick video showing how it's done. It's really nice. And um, basically, you just prick your finger and get a drop of blood. And then the blood is put into a little vial and then you send it back to Kind Body with a prepaid shipping label. Next. In a few days, we'll get those results back and you'll get um, information on what your test showed. So you just clean your, uh, you just register your kit, which you do online. Um, then you poke your finger and you get the drops of blood um, onto the card and then ship the card to Kind Body. It's very, very easy. Next. The female fertility test tests for seven hormones. So it tests for AMH, which is an ovarian reserve test. Um, we like that number to be between one and six. If it's less than one, uh, that's a low number and might mean that uh, you have a lower number of eggs and uh, would we would normally recommend a fuller assessment if that's the case. If it's over six, it might mean you have some pl you have plenty of eggs, but you might have some ovulation problems. And again, uh, uh, some of these other hormones may tell us what's going on or a further assessment might be a good idea in that situation as well. TSH is a thyroid test. So TSH is one of those things when the TSH is high, the thyroid function is low because it stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So if your thyroid isn't functioning as much, then the thyroid, then your body has to make more thyroid stimulating hormone to get the thyroid to do what it needs to do. So it's a very sensitive test for thyroid function. And abnormalities in thyroid function can affect ovulation and pregnancy. Free thyroxine is the actual thyroid hormone. So if free thyroxine is higher, your thyroid is making more of that. And if it's lower, your thyroid uh, gland is making less, sorry. FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. We talked about that. Follicle stimulating hormone, we like that to be that number to be between two and 10. If it's over 10, between 10 and 20, that's in what we call the borderline range. And that's more an area where you may be having some cycles where your um, ovulation is off, or you might be uh, having a lower, um, lower egg count as well. Um, and um, 
Prolactin is milk hormone. So prolactin is the hormone your body uses to make milk and abnormalities. And that can also affect ovulation. Uh, this is one of the reasons why women who are breastfeeding don't get their periods because they have high prolactin hormone levels. LH uh, is another hormone that's made by the brain. And LH's main job is to stimulate the ovary to ovulate. But um, it also regulates the length of your cycle, helps us make progesterone after we ovulate. So LH is an important hormone and can give us some useful clues as to what's going on with your cycles as well. And estradiol is a hormone that's made by the ovary itself. Um, so estradiol is made and grows more when the egg ripens up and um, also is made in the second half of the cycle after you ovulate to support a pregnancy. Next. Um, I did see, before I get into this slide, I did see one question in the chat about, do you have to go off the pill to do these tests? Yes, you should be off hormone contraception if you're doing these tests. One, one exception to that is the IUD uh, is not going to affect these hormones a lot, but um, you should be um, off, uh, like, say, birth control pills or the patch uh, to get good results with the kind at home test. And um, Finally, uh, tonight we're offering a gift to you for being so nice and coming and joining us. We're so happy to meet all of you. And so we have a code for a discount that has to, uh, on your next fertility and family building assessment, uh, those assessments are $100 off or, or um, with, for the self-pay price for fertility and family building assessments, $500 off for an egg freezing or an IVF cycle. Um, and $200 off for an IUI cycle. And you can schedule those with KindBody. You just have to book by March 31st and use the code MAR22. And finally, um, any questions? I know that, uh, you know, the questions have been getting answered in the chat, but are there any other questions? And maybe um, someone can... Um, Tell me the tests that or the questions that you uh, would like answered. Rivka, were you able to see any questions in the chat that um, you'd like me to take? Um, yeah, let's see. Um... Or Dr. Van Dixon. I see one at the end here um, from Marsha. Do you do egg retrievals with endometriomas? Yes, we do. Um, a lot of times we recommend not removing endometriomas before we do egg retrievals because that kind of surgery can actually also remove part of the ovary uh, and diminish your ovarian reserves. So we try to leave them in place until after your eggs have been retrieved and you're satisfied with the number that you have, if at all possible. Now, sometimes we have to, uh, sometimes we really need to remove those endometriomas. So it kind of depends on how things are going with you individually. Yeah, I saw another question. Um, can, endometriosis, can endometriosis cause or contribute to miscarriages? It, it may be linked. Uh, we don't know for sure, but there does seem to be some increased miscarriage rates with people who have severe endometriosis. So there may be a connection, but we're not really clear on why, unless Dr. Ben Dixon, do you have more information on that? Um, sorry, I was distracted for a second because I was trying to um, work with the team to unmute myself. <laughs> so I missed, I'm so sorry, I missed that last question. <laughs> do you uh, know of any connection between endometriosis and miscarriages? I, I said that it may be linked, no. but I'm yeah, not I think really we don't really know. Yeah, I don't think we know now. I mean, there's that one really good study that looked at um, recipients of egg donation that, and these they looked at women whose uteruses were completely normal versus women who have had adenomyosis, which is a different disease, um, and endometriosis. 
Um, and what they found is that the pregnancy rates were the same um, for those women who were using egg donors. So the thought is, is that if you have that, um, you know, there's not probably a difference um, in the implantation and thus miscarriage, but you know, there's so much that we don't really understand and know about miscarriages um, that I think it's hard to say. Um, I think there are some questions in the chat about the success rates with IUIs and success rates of IVF and egg freezing. And that's a really hard question to answer because it depends, it depends on your age and it depends on your ovarian reserve. So your age is going to affect the quality of the eggs. And therefore, if you get a certain number of eggs out, what is the chance that you're going to get pregnant with those eggs? Um, your age can also affect your ovarian reserve. Your ovarian reserve is the number of eggs that you have and how well your ovaries are functioning. And so if you do one cycle of egg freezing or one cycle of IVF, how many eggs you're going to get out? right? Because if you get more eggs out in one cycle, right, that is more opportunities to get pregnant. So it is a really complicated um, question. So we, it's really hard to give an answer without kind of really getting into the specifics of an individual. Um, there are so many great questions in here, there's by so the many. way. There's so many. <laughs> here. So, um, there's one about how many eggs should be frozen. And um, that goes along with what Dr. Ben Dixon said. You know, there are some individual individual variants with that. And, and we can talk about that at your assessments. But um, typically, if you're a woman under the age of 35, we recommend 10 eggs per baby that you want to have the eggs for. Cause if you think about it, you know, say if you have 10 eggs um, and that's kind of an average number to get with an, with an IVF or an egg freezing cycle, um, say 80% of them fertilize. Now you're down to eight, say half of those make it to the stage of called a blastocyst stage where we know that they can either be frozen or tested. Now we're down to four. And then depending on your age, you know, some of them may not be chromosomally normal. Some of them may be normal, but not implant or implant, but you miscarry. So that's why there's attrition at every step of the way. So that's why we say um, uh, 10 eggs per baby is just kind of a rule of thumb. Yeah. And one of the nice things that we do at Kind Body is we really try to leverage technology to make this process easy for you. So actually for all of our patients, when they, if you um, log into Kind Body and you have an account, you're going to have a dashboard and in your dashboard, you have a fertility calculator and you can put in how old you are and how many eggs that you have frozen. And it will tell you your chance of having a pregnancy. So I always go through that with my patients and we play around with the numbers and we say, okay, you know, if you have five eggs, your chance of having a baby is 30%. But if you have 10, it's 50%. And wow, you know, for you, it doesn't matter if those 10 eggs come from two cycles versus one, as long as we get those 10 eggs all at the age of 35, this is what your chance of having a baby is. Um, and so that is really, that's really useful. Um, and so there was another question in here about just kind of like what it feels like to go through egg freezing. Um, and I would actually say, most people do really well. I think most people build it up in their heads and it's not as bad as they're going to expect mm -hmm. it to be. Um, but there's a couple of things that you need to keep into consideration. A lot of the side effects with egg freezing IVF are related to the number of eggs that you have. So if you don't have that many eggs, less than 10, you're not going to have that many side effects, which is good, right? And the typical side effects are really not related to the hormones them themselves that you're taking. They're more related to like what those hormones are doing to your ovaries, right? So in your ovaries, we're trying to make five, 10 eggs grow. And so your ovaries are bigger. So if your ovaries are bigger, you're going to feel a little bloated and full, right? So that, that doesn't happen the whole time. It kind of kicks in at the very end of the cycle, right before the retrieval and might last for three to five days afterwards, but it's not an extended period of time. If you are lucky enough to have a really great ovarian reserve and you're going to get a lot of eggs and one cycle of egg freezing, you're going to feel a little bit more uncomfortable. Um, and this is where we step in. 
we really make sure that we're managing your hormones when you're going through the cycle and we can give you different hormones based on kind of what we're seeing so that we can try to do everything we can to really minimize the symptoms that you have, decrease the severity and shorten the amount of time that you feel uncomfortable. I'm seeing a lot of questions about acupuncture. And so um, uh, Kind Body does offer acupuncture at they offer kind of an at-home acupressure kit, which is kind of fun. And you can see that on our website too. So yes, we do think acupuncture can be helpful for some people. Um, it, I don't typically see a dramatic improvement, but uh, the, the studies that, um, that I've seen that seem to be the best are that if you look at people comparing acupuncture to no acupuncture, the people who did acupuncture did do better. However, if you compare people who did acupuncture to fake acupuncture, then it was kind of the same. So I take that to mean either acupuncture is really beneficial because it creates a great placebo effect, or it really does work, but it's not as important where you put the needles. I don't know quite what the, uh, what the answer to that is, but it does seem to help versus doing nothing. So um, if you're interested in acupuncture, it is something that you can do either on your own with a local practitioner, or if you want to try these um, at home uh, kits where they teach you how to do it, uh, that's also an option for you. Yeah. One of the questions in the chat, um, Kristen, was a woman asking about, you know, doing egg freezing after the age of 38. Um, and you absolutely can do egg freezing after the age of 38. Um, I think the most important thing to think about with egg freezing is just understanding what you're going to get out of it in one cycle. So how many eggs do you have? Like, what is your follicle count? So what are we starting with? What is your AMH? And from that and how old you are, we can put those things together and think about, okay, in one cycle of egg freezing, how many eggs are you actually going to get? And then what does that mean for you in terms of your chances of having a baby if you're getting three eggs and one cycle and you're doing that at the age of 39? At the end of the day, it's our responsibility to tell you kind of what you have to go through to go through an egg freezing cycle, what the risks are, what the side effects are. But at the end of the day, that no if that number of like your chance of success is low, we still wanna support you in that journey because that 3% chance, 5% chance that you could um, have of having a baby, and because you're just really not ready at this particular time, that could be a baby in the future. I have patients, I have a patient who froze her eggs at 42, used them at 47. She didn't have a lot of eggs at 42, but she has a baby. She has a baby because she froze her eggs at 42. And if someone told her like, it doesn't, you know, you shouldn't do egg freezing after the age of 38, she wouldn't have a baby right now, at least a baby with her. I mean, she could have a baby. She could do egg donor, of course, but she wouldn't have a baby with her own genetics. And so you, it's super important to always speak with a provider, understand what your particular options are and make a decision for yourself that makes the most sense for you. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, should we do one last question? Um, let's do sure. um, how accurate are ovulation tests? They're pretty good. If I, I tried to answer this in the chat, but they're, they're pretty good if you are ovulatory. So if you have regular cycles and you actually are ovulating, they can help you time ovulation pretty well. And likewise, uh, I've had patients use them to avoid pregnancy because they're not ready for a baby yet and don't want to go on hormones and use them to avoid ovulation at the time, you know, and they can be pretty effective like that. Uh, where the kits aren't as, aren't as helpful is if you have irregular cycles or ovulatory problems, uh, it might not pick it up. But even that, if you're using an ovulation prediction kit and you're not getting information, you're not able to tell when you're ovulating, even that's useful information because now we know, okay, this is an area we need to look into a little bit more. Rivka, there's one more question that I was just kind of scanning the chat that I think is really important to answer. Um, and someone asked about predicting menopause. Um, and so we don't have a great way to predict menopause. So there are factors 
that could that could help us conclude that it might happen earlier for you. For example, if your mother and her sisters all through, went through menopause early, um, that's something that you really should consider when you're thinking about when you wanna start your family, right? Um, and then also when we do these markers of ovarian reserve, I, I do have patients that are young and are 32 and have really low ovarian reserve. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna go through menopause early. It, it, you can't predict that. Even women who lose an ovary, someone was asking about one ovary. So if you have one ovary, you know, it's gonna function um, it really just depends on like how many eggs you're gonna get or depending on like what's available in that one ovary. Sometimes when you lose an ovary, your body just um, readjusts how many eggs it's losing in one month because women who lose an ovary only go through menopause about maybe on average like six months earlier than women who have two ovaries. Um, so unfortunately, there's not just a great way of predicting it. And even if you have a low ovarian reserve, it does not mean that you are gonna go through early menopause, but it does mean that if you need to use fertility treatments, like IVF, or you want to do egg freezing um, in the future, it may limit the number of eggs that you can get in one cycle. Sorry, I just thought it was super important to address yeah. that question. So thank you for yeah, I totally um, trying to remember who put that in there. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, and this event will be posted on our YouTube channel for anyone that didn't make it. And if anyone has any more questions that they want to be answered, feel free to email us at navigator at kindbuddy.com or to visit our website. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you please so come. Much. Yeah, please come see um, the two Kristens on the <laughs> East and West Coast, one in Atlanta and one in Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everyone.